a time to tell of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadow. Time to tell strange tales of fantasy and the supernatural. Mystery Theater presents The Kitchen Table by Alan King. Folks, I'm ashamed. Absolutely ashamed to offer you this property at the ridiculous price of $2,500. Only 15 miles from the city. Two acres of land. Why, with prices the way they are today, it's a steal, an absolute steal. Uh, what I want to know, Mr. Jenkins, is why we're allowed to steal it. Why look a gift horse in the mouth, Mr. Keel? Uh, but I'll tell you. This whole property of 100 acres is being sold off. The owner died a couple of months ago. He kept this house for his help. It used to be the farmhouse itself many years ago. It's going to need some work done on it, Mr. Jenkins. Yes. I mean, it hasn't been kept in good repair. Of oh, course, so it needs a few repairs. Do them yourself. Young couple like you got lots of energy. I'll tell you, Mrs. Keel, you can't afford not to buy this place. We didn't admit it to Mr. Jenkins, the real estate agent, but we felt the same way. Have you ever gone looking for a house to buy, and then one day... You come to an old, untidy, neglected place that has character. And you know that when you start working on it, it'll come alive again under your hands. Well, Sally and I felt, as Mr. Jenkins said, we couldn't afford not to buy it. So we raised what we could, took a mortgage for the rest, and bought it. We couldn't begin to tell you of all the things we stripped off that house. The coats of paint, the, the layers of awful wallpaper... We found that the floors were of lovely old pine. Wide boards, hidden beneath coats of varnish and then linoleum. The outside walls were coated with some kind of stucco, but when the electrician came to drill for wiring, he ran into square timbers nearly two feet thick. And the kitchen. Oh, there was the greatest discovery of them all. Under the wallpaper on one of the walls, we noticed an... Irregularity, and we began to poke around. Honey, where's uh, the flashlight? Oh, here you are. Oh, thanks. Uh, let's see what we... Sally, hmm? there's a great big hole behind here. What is it? Yeah, there's a great big space behind here. It's all blackened. What is it? Oh, I know. It's one of those great kitchen fireplaces. You know the kind. Well, they had a spin. How? Oh, and a hook for holding kettles. And... Oh, Jim, it's so exciting. Oh, let's pull the rest of the stuff away. Come on. Uh, what? Get me careful. Oh, look out. Oh. Oh, Jim. I can hardly believe it. It's a real pioneer fireplace. <laughs> Big oven and everything. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, and look at the size of it. You know, you could almost sit in it. Well, that's what they used to do. Oh, they, I they, know. Oh, they had seats at each side so everybody could get close to the fire. <laughs> oh, oh. Jim? What? We've got to restore this kitchen. Just as it was. We'll furnish it just right. The, the kind of table and, and chairs we would have used in, in those days. We'll, we'll get the rest of this paper off the walls. And hey, then we'll... hey, 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 wait a minute. How are we going to get the proper furniture? Oh, we'll find it somewhere. Oh, I can see the kitchen already. Just as it'll be in... And just as it must have been then. As we talked, standing in front of that great fireplace we'd uncovered... The room seemed to take on a softer, mellower atmosphere. There was a feeling of life about the room, which I found hard to describe. It was very exciting. We hardly took the time to stop for supper. And then we were at it again, scraping and tearing away. All the time we were working, a wind had been springing up. A storm was on its way, and before long it broke. While the thunder and lightning raged and the rain drove against the outside of the house, we worked on, feeling strangely snug and secure against the violence of the storm. With the start, I realized that someone was pounding on the back door. Sally, did you hear that? What, darling? Well, it sounded like somebody knocking on the door. Uh, I can't hear a thing with this storm going on. Yeah, there it is again. Oh, I heard that all right. Must be somebody looking for shelter. It's the 
back door out of the kitchen here, I think. Well, I'll go and see. Is there somebody there? Oh. Can I trouble you for shelter? Uh, just till the storm stops. Of course. Uh, come on in. Thank you. Uh, sorry to intrude on you, but it's a wild night. Uh, oh, evening, ma'am. Good evening. Oh, well, come along and uh, sit down. I'm uh, sorry we have a fire going, but uh, we just discovered that there was a fireplace in that wall. Didn't take you long. Some folks lived here for years, never found it. You mean you knew it was there? Good fireplace. Draws good. Who are you? Name's Dan Sharp. Know a lot of things about this house. You mean you used to live here or work here or something? This kitchen now is different. There used to be a table in the center, a big table, solid. Ain't far away. A table? You mean the original table is still in existence? Had an auction. Walt Bender beat on the table, got it. Walt's dead now. Son still has it. There was two rockers. Sam has got them. Sam's dead too. And a gun. There was a gun over the fireplace. He muzzled looter. He and Brace bought it. Don't know why. Somebody else in the Bryce place now. Still got the gun, though. No. Well, are, are you trying to tell us that all the, the furniture out of this kitchen is around somewhere? Way far away. Could we buy those things from them? Get them back where they came from? We ought to. We ought to be back. Long hair. Oh, won't you tell us something more about this house, Mr. Sharp? Did you live here yourself? Is that it? Jonathan lived here. Died here, too. Night like this. Went out to the barn. Wind blew a branch off the big elm. Fell on Jonathan. Killed him. How terrible. Wind stopped right after. It's dropping now. Who was Jonathan? How do you know about all this? Rain stopping too. It's time to go. Oh, you can't go yet. We want to know more about what... Time to go. Maybe someday Jonathan will tell you what he'd done. Happened in this room. Jonathan was, uh, was buried in the churchyard. Well, what are you talking about? Thank you for your hospitality, ma'am. Oh, don't get up, Sam. I'll let myself out. And don't forget you're doing right. Mighty fine fireplace it was. You're doing right. Jim? Who was he? I don't know. It was a stranger sort of... <gasps> Sally, what's the matter? Jimmy, look. Where he was sitting. Yeah? What about her? He came in out of the rain. He, he must have been soaked. But with that chair and, and the floor, that they're, they're bone dry. Sally was right. There wasn't a drop of water anywhere near where the old man had been sitting. We were faced with the fact that a ghost had sat in our kitchen and talked to us. And Sally and I didn't believe in ghosts, so we were left with only one thing to do. Pretend he was a ghost and then go on from there. Well, what do you suggest we do, then? Go and visit all these people he mentioned. Look, if all he said was true, we can furnish this kitchen as it was before. I can remember the names. Bender, um, uh, Harris and Bryce. Oh, Jim, we've got to do it. It worked out very well. Everything was where the old man said it was. We found the old muzzle loader at the Bryce place and got it very cheap. And at the Harris farm, they had the two rockers and a, oh, a wonderful old pine dresser that the ghost hadn't even mentioned. It took some haggling to get that, and we paid more than we wanted to, but oh, it was worth it to see it sitting there in our kitchen. It was actually two weeks before we found all the articles. We went to the Bender farm last, the place where the table was supposed to be. That old table? Oh, I threw it out. You got rid of it? Why? It was too big and clumsy. Didn't fit into this kitchen when we fixed it over. Where is it now? Oh, it's out in the dry shed somewhere. I just told Hi to get it out of here. You want to look at it? Oh, we'd like to. Uh, Which way is the dry shed? Well, you can go out this door here. It's on the right as you go out to the barn. You can't miss the table. It's so big. Oh, 
That's it, all right, Jim. Yep. Oh, can we lift some of this stuff off? Yeah, sure. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, they certainly pile up a lot of junk on these farms. Mm-hmm. Annie, look at this. Bits of old chairs, broken garden tools, <laughs> old wrenches. You never know what you're going to find in a place like this. <sighs> oh, boy. Yeah, that's all of it. Hey, that sure is a big table. <laughs> Enormous. Oh, yeah. Heavy, too. Hi. Wonder why they put that dreadful varnish on everything. There's coats of it. You want me to scrape some of it away? Oh no! Oh, it's bound to be good wood underneath. Let's go back and tell her we'll take it. Hi, Bender brought it down one Friday evening, and Jim and I spent the weekend working on it with scrapers and paint remover. <laughs> By Sunday night, we were tired out. It's a solid-looking table. <laughs> Looks so right in here. There's such an atmosphere to this kitchen now. Everything seems to belong. You know, I can't help wondering what it was that happened here. Happened? Remember what the old man said when Jonathan done what he did? Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. And who was Jonathan? I don't suppose there's any way of finding out. If anything did happen? Hmm. <sighs> Funny about that old man, isn't it? We're beginning to accept him quite casually. <laughs> And yet, actually, he couldn't have been real. You're as tired as we are. You can imagine all kinds of strange things. I wish I could imagine myself in bed and asleep this minute. I would have to get to work early tomorrow morning. Oh, do you, darling? Yeah. 8.30. You better call me at 7. If you have breakfast at 7.30, I can make it. Yeah? Jim, come here. Quickly. Well, what is it? It's something. Oh, Jim, hurry. Well, what is it? A, a skunk in the stove? No, no, no. Look. Look. The kitchen table. Huh? There, at that end. Looks like a great big stain. Yeah. Now, where in hell did that come from? I don't know. Only I'm quite certain it wasn't there last night when we went to bed. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Something leaking from the ceiling? I don't think so. Funny thing is, the stain seems to be absolutely dry. More than that, it looks it looks old. Very old. Jim? I know this sounds silly, but I just can't help feeling that it's blood. Oh no, Sally, that's ridiculous. How, how could it be blood? Well, how could it be there at all? We sanded that right down last night. It was as clean as we could get it. Maybe we didn't notice it in the evening light. Oh, you know very well it wasn't there last night. Yeah. Now, what, what, what's going on in this house? First of all, an old man who comes in out of the rain and doesn't leave a wet mark anywhere. And now a table that comes up with a blood stain overnight. There, you said it too. Huh? A blood stain. Just as if you knew. Oh, well, it, it, it just slipped out. Oh, look, honey, give me a piece of sandpaper. While you get the breakfast, I'm going to sand that mark off. There. That's going. Here, see? Well, I haven't got time to work on it anymore, but I think with some more elbow grease, we can get it out. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll keep working on it today while you're out, and by the time you're back, it'll be all gone. That's what I thought. When I left for work, I was convinced that we'd taken the whole affair too seriously, that somehow the wood had absorbed some color from one of the layers of paint under the varnish, and that perhaps exposure to the air had brought it to the surface. But when I came home that night, I threw that theory overboard. No, Jimmy, no. It's no good. This is something beyond our understanding. But the stain responded to sanding this morning before I left. I know, and I went on sanding. I had it very nearly out, and then the phone rang. It was Mother, and she kept me talking for 20 minutes. When I got back, the stain was there, as clear as ever. Jim, I don't know what it is, but I'm afraid of it. We worked on the stain with sandpaper, but it always came back. We even tried to bleach it with oxalic acid, but that was no good. I suggested painting it over, but Sally wouldn't hear of it. 
rather than spoil the pine surface, she'd cover up the stain with a tablecloth for the time being. We thought then, if we could get some information about the history of our house, it might help. So we called on Mr. Tyson, the publisher of the local four-page newspaper. He was a twinkling man of 75 with a long and retentive memory. So you're the people that bought that place, eh? Had you got a bargain on it? Well, that's what we're not quite sure about, Mr. Tyson. The price is low enough, but we've got a mystery on our hands. Mystery, eh? Well, we thought perhaps you could give us some information that would help to clear it up. What kind of mystery? We don't like to tell you because it's hard to believe, but if we can clear it up, then we'll tell you all about it. Well, it might make a good story for your paper. They can always use a good story. What's the information you want? Well, first of all, who was Jonathan Sharp? He used to live in our house. Yes, I remember Jonathan Sharp. I, uh... Yeah, it was just a young fellow when he died. Uh, wasn't he killed in a storm? Uh, uh, hit by a branch of a tree or something? Yes. How did you know? Oh, uh, someone told us. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's how it happened anyway. He's a big fellow, Jonathan. A bad temper. Got him into trouble many a time. Good farmer, though. Made a deal of money, but he never spent much. Was there ever anyone called Dan Sharp? Dan Sharp. Oh, yes. Now I'd forgotten about him. Yeah, Dan Sharp. He was a... He was a cousin of Jonathan's, I believe. Yeah, that's right, a cousin. Their dads were brothers, and they owned that farm together. Yeah. Uh, did Jonathan and Dan work it together? No, no, no. I don't believe they did. Well, they may have for a while. I couldn't say exactly. Uh, what happened to Dan, Mr. Tyson? I never did know. Went away somewhere, I guess, and I can just remember him as a little fella, wiry, but, oh, I didn't see Dan Sharp after, oh, I guess after I was out of my teens. Is he buried in the churchyard? No, I wouldn't know that either. I know Jonathan is because I remember the funeral. First one I was ever at. But you could go over there and see if there's a stone for Dan. Oh, we might do that. And uh, thanks, Mr. Tyson. We had a few things straight anyway. <laughs> Afraid I haven't been much help. Hey, hey, but don't forget me when you solve that mystery. We found Jonathan's grave. Died April 14th, 1898. And there were the graves of other Sharps, but of Dan Sharp there wasn't a trace. The matter rested there for a few days. We felt that sometime we'd find the explanation... Sally kept busy about the house, making curtains, doing more sanding, waxing other pieces of the old furniture. In spite of the mystery, we were coming to love our old house. And then, one night, many things were made clear. I'd been working late. I got home about 11. When I opened the door, to my amazement, Sally ran flying into my arms, half sobbing with pure terror. Oh, Jim, thank God you're home. It's been awful. I was terrified. Oh, darling, what's happened? Oh, that terrible man. A man? Did somebody come here? Sally, what are you... Are you all right? Oh, it's not, not anybody that came. Nobody's been here. It's, it's what I saw. What you saw? Well, I, I didn't mind being alone here. You know I don't get frightened. Well, sure I know. I'd been very busy all day. The town wasn't dragging at all. I was sewing with the machine in the afternoon, and then I went out and did some gardening until it was dusk. After that, I came in and made myself some supper. I was pretty sleepy after supper, but I kept on working for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and then I just had to sit down. I sat in one of the rockers in the, in the kitchen in front of the fire. There was a little chill in the air, and I'd put a few bits of wood on. I was sitting there, relaxing, and... Well, perhaps I dozed off. I don't know. I can't be sure. Anyway, I suddenly seemed not to be in the chair anymore, but standing by the door. I was I was conscious of a different atmosphere in the room. It, it was menacing. I, I know. I was afraid. And, and no matter what was happening in that room, I couldn't move. Happening? How do you mean, Sally? The table was there in the center. Yeah. At one end of it, there were two men standing. They were having an argument. One was a big man. He, he was angry, and the other... The other man was... Who? The little old man. Dan Sharp. What? I could see his face. There was no doubt. They were arguing. I couldn't hear distinctly. It was something about property, about the farm, it seemed. The little man said something about being cheated out of something, and then... Yes? And then... The... The big man. He got the other man by the throat. He 
forced him back over the table. The little man tried to fight back. He, he hit the big man in the face, and then the big man went on holding the little man down with one hand, and, and then with his right hand, he reached back and pulled out a knife, and, and he punched it right in the little man's chest. Oh, no. There. There, darling. Honey, it's all right. It, it's only a dream. But I saw it so plainly. He, he, he drew the knife out. He, he stood there breathing heavily. And, yeah. and then the body of the little man, it, it, it sort of crumbled and, and, and fell sideways. And I could see the table, Jim. I could see it. Right there on the end was a spreading pool of blood. It was an awful experience for Sally. I tried to persuade her it was a dream, something that had stemmed from her imagination, but she wouldn't accept it. It was too real, she said, and she felt sure something else was going to happen. I knew that wasn't the end of our mystery, and I was right. It was some time before the end came. We had decided we wanted a root cellar, and we hired a man with a power shovel to excavate it for us, close to the house. Halfway through, he came to us with something in his hands. Turned up this box. Yeah, don't know what it is. Box? Yep, looks kind of old. All nailed down, too. Uh, thought I'd better bring it in. Thank you. I wonder what it can be. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe some money got buried there. Never can tell. <laughs> oh, what a hope. Well, it's yours anyway. I'll get back outside. Think I can finish up in half an hour. Well, thanks for bringing it in. Okay. What do you think it is, Jim? Well, we'll soon find out. I had a big screwdriver here somewhere. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Exciting, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a musty sort of smell to it. I hope it's gold pieces. Did they have gold pieces in those days? Oh, we'd never have the luck to... Sally. What is it? It's not gold pieces. It isn't money. It's... <gasps> bones. And they look like human bones. They were human bones, all right. And then, as we stood there gazing at them, an idea came filtering into our minds... Sally's dream. Perhaps it wasn't a dream at all, but a revelation. Dan Sharp had been killed. In that night of vision, Sally had seen him stabbed by someone who was obviously Jonathan. And Jonathan had disposed of a little man's body by... by burning it in the fireplace and then sealing it up. But just in case it might be discovered, he took the bones, which wouldn't burn, put them in a box, and buried them deep near the house. That was it. That must be it. And in that moment of inspiration, I turned back the cloth on the big kitchen table. The stain seemed more vivid than ever. Jim, I know what to do. What? Remember the night Dan Sharp came? He spoke of Jonathan. He said, Jonathan was buried in the churchyard. As if to say, but I wasn't. And you think that... To put that poor old man at rest, we must... Bury him in the churchyard. It was like a burden falling from our shoulders. We took the box with the bones to Mr. Clark, the minister, and explained something of the story. He was very nice about it and arranged everything. It was a very short, quiet service. Only Mr. Tyson's in the newspaper and Jim and I were there. And then the bones of Dan Sharp were returned to the earth. As we returned to our house, we both shared the feeling that we'd done the right thing. And Mr. Tyson, who came with us, agreed. He was most anxious to see the table with the bloodstain. Hmm. Mighty big table, Mr. Keel. Yes, it's a good piece of pine. I turn the cloth back so you can see the stain. Oh! Jim, look. Good Lord. It's gone. The stain is gone. But I, I, I don't understand. Honestly, Mr. Tyson, this morning it was... Well, it was plainer than day. <laughs> it was, eh? Well, now it seems to me it's one of two things. What do you mean? Well, either you two young folks are making up a good story. Oh, but oh, no. Or you've put the ghost of old Dan Sharp to rest. I don't mind which it is. Either way, it's a good story. If not the best my paper's had in 30 years.
The Kitchen Table by Alan King was item two in a brief series of tales of the supernatural written for presentation on the Mystery Theater with Arch McDonald as Jim, Sandra Scott as Sally, and Tommy Tweed as Sharp. Joe Austin was heard as Old Man Jenkins. Alan King as Mr. Tyson, the newspaper editor, and Jim Barron as the excavation contractor with Eleanor Beecroft as Mrs. Bender. Sound effects were by Alex Sheridan. Technical operation by John Skillen. This is Bill Lawrence speaking. Mm-hmm.